Everybody feeling good? I know some of us were, uh, had a busy weekend with, um, of course, a, a great exploit in the J.C. Napier community. And uh, it was an amazing day. It was extraordinary to see so many uh, from all different churches, all different ministries serving together in the inner city. And uh, we teamed up with Chris Overstreet and their ministry. They have a beautiful ministry. Came in. They've, they've actually brought their, I call it the transformer truck that opens up into this you know, big old concert setup where you can do 5,000 people, rock the hood. And so we, we, we put all that together. There was abundance of food, so much generosity, so many people serving together. So thank you for everyone that came. There was people saved and, and delivered and prayers went forth and, and so, so many amazing things happened. And we're exceedingly grateful for everyone who contributed, who was part of it, who prayed, who covered those who went in. And uh, it was a great day, and we just heard some amazing stories. I, I will tell you one story that touched my heart was um, there was a lady uh, who came up, and I think her name was uh, Miss Doris or Delora or something like that. But she had been in uh, Sudicum Napier community since like 1960. She's grown up and seen this whole community. If you know this community, it's, it's rough and tumble. There's gangs. There's, everything's going down over on that side of town right now. And she was just so elated. She was just like so excited, so grateful. The sweet old lady, a real matriarch of that community, she said, I've prayed for a day like this. I've prayed for a day like this. And God is answering my prayers. And, and, um, and so, but I can imagine being there all those decades and, and enduring, like literally Sarah was like, and she's still alive, you know, because it's, it's a rough community. And, and sadly, you know, we have these pockets of devastation all across America. Inner cities, as many of you guys know, we, we love to go to the Indian reservations all across America. We're preparing for rolling thunder this summer again, going out to Montana and Washington and Oregon. <clears throat> and uh, so we love to go to these places that we know God's heart is there. You can feel it. You can feel, you know, the amount of fatherless kids and... and um, and so, uh, but just hearing this lady said, I've prayed, I've prayed for this day. And, and she was just all lit up. She was just like so grateful and thankful for what is happening. And I believe it's just the beginning. I believe there's a new wave of compassion that's going to roll across our city in the name of Jesus. Because there's areas, we don't have to really travel that far to find mission fields. They're right here. And, uh, and, and I believe that, you know, this morning I want to talk to you about something that pertains to exactly what we experienced yesterday and what we get to experience here in Harvest Sound community. We have the opportunity to, to be, as I like to say, on mission. Someone say on mission. And um, thank you. And so what we're doing is we're raising up a generation, and really it's always generations. It's never one generation. If you're going to be effective, we need Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob working together. Uh, no one generation can do it alone and be effective. And I think that was part of the, sadly, the downfall of the brilliance, first of all, of the, the Jesus revolution, the Jesus movement that happened. It's like, by God's grace, a whole generation began to come out of a, a, a drunken haze and drugged up state, uh, you know, rebellion against authority, all this stuff, and then it began to be swept into the kingdom, Right? And, and, and it was amazing to see that happen. Um, however, you know, most people say the downfall, the downside was the, gener the, the older generation, the leaders, even the pastors of the, the time, were not ready to receive that generation. And so many fell away and just got disenfranchised with the church. And, and, then, and then we didn't, we couldn't hold that harvest. But I believe we're coming into a time where, where we're going to be able to hold the harvest Someone say, hold the harvest. Amen. You don't want to do all that fishing and just lose the fish, just slip through your grip like, oh, I almost had it. How many times have you heard that from fishermen? I had them on the line, but, you know, uh, it was the biggest one ever. It's like, you know, it's like we want to, in this spiritual battle for souls, we want to be able to hold the harvest and bring them in, right? And, and, and the beauty of, 
of a, a healthy church is not only do we do fishing. Jesus said, if you'll follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. If you're following the real Jesus, you're going to get his heart for souls, right? And it, it, but we don't eat the fish. We clean the fish. <laughs> Does that make sense? So, I mean, I believe that a healthy church is a church that not only catches the fish, but then cleans the fish. And that's where discipling comes in. And, um, and so I want to take, take you to a, a passage um, that, to me, has been really famous, really stood out to me since I was even a young man. I began to, to, to see what was being said and, and proclaimed in this passage, and, and it really gripped me. So let's uh, stand for the reading of God's Word, and let's go to Luke chapter 4, verse 14. I just want to say as we're standing, just a shout out to our team that served so well uh, yesterday, did an amazing job uh, setting up, going, getting there early, you know, all, the, all that it takes to, to accomplish such a, such a day, such a beautiful day. Um, and also um, who, who, to Odie and Hannah and Bailey, they, man, they, they, they released their testimonies and it was like thunder. I mean, it was like lightning going across the community. It did, did it so well, just such an anointing. You could feel things shifting, just the power of the testimony that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the power of our testimony. Don't ever forget your story. Don't ever forget where you came from, what you've been through. There's power. No one can take that from you. It's yours. And God says, use it. Set captives free. All right, so let's read this. So, um, Verse 14 says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as it was his custom. He stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet of Isaiah Isaiah was handed to him, Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. He has, or to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Please be seated. So let's get into this. This is, this is power. This is amazing. This is what I have always called the mission statement of Jesus. Is anyone interested in the mission statement of Jesus? The very purpose for which he came. The very essence of his mission, and his DNA. We're talking about being on mission with Jesus. Okay? Um, and so we see this as, and, and I think I want to point out to you something here. It says it was his custom to come into the synagogue and teach and, 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 and be in a corporate gathering. So a lot of people say he left us an example that we could follow. And then in, in the times we're right now, well, you know, I don't know. I think I'll just stay online. Uh, you know, I'll just uh, stay home. Or, you know, I, I just want to encourage you. You see here that this was Jesus' custom to come into the corporate gathering and to worship and to teach. And, and I believe it, if it was good enough for him, come on, someone. It needs to be good enough for us. Because we're in a day where I think we've got a lot of lazy Christians. Can I say that? Especially out of COVID, man. People are just like hanging around in their pajamas all day now. Just stay home, you know. And I just believe there's something that happens when we come together. There's an anointing that you can't get any other way. You can't just get it online. There's something about flesh and blood coming together. The body of Christ being assembled. Is this making sense? You know, praise God for online. And there's ways we can... Uh, disseminate the, the gospel to the ends of the earth in ways we never could before. It's amazing the gifts and the technology we have that we can use for God's glory. But there's something about being known, coming together in a life group, being known, being heard, being prayed for. There's stuff that can happen in an intimate setting or in a corporate setting that can't happen when we're alone. 
Okay, it can't happen through a text. It can't happen through an email. Praise God for all that technology. However, there's something about rubbing shoulders and, and being in it together. And when the shaking comes, I believe there's more shaking to come. I just believe that we're in these times. If It's all going to come down to who do you know and who do you trust? Where's your community? If you've got flimsy relationships, you, you'll be left out there dang, dangling. Does this make sense? And so get in while the getting's good, you know. It's not time to, to, to when, when the shaking comes, when a, when a, a tragedy comes, it's, it's, it's too late to go, do I have any friends? Do I have anyone who cares? Do I have anyone I can lean on? Am I connected to the body of Christ? And so it's important to, to build while you can, work while there's still light. Does this make sense? And so uh, we see that Jesus would come and he would teach in the synagogue. Wouldn't it be amazing to, to have been there? Just be there to see Jesus. This is the word, teaching the word. Some, someone got that. Okay, Jesus was the word. He was teaching. I mean, I'd love to just to be able to be there and, and, and hear these words that amaze the people, it says. It amazed the people. And there was such uh, favor on his life. It says, all spoke, that's pretty amazing, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Okay? Now, if you read a little further, you, you'll see the nature, human nature real quick, okay? Then he does a little dialogue right there. You can read it in verse 23. And next thing you know, it went from everyone amazed at his teaching. And next thing you know, verse 28 says, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. And they got up and they drove him out of town and took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But... He walked right through the crowd and went his own way. It wasn't his time. But if you don't get too enamored by the, the accolades of man, you might be in a season where everyone thinks you're great. You, probably 95% of everyone is like, man, you're great. You're awesome. You're doing great. You're a sign. You're a wonder. I mean, that's all good. Enjoy it while it's there. Because on a, on a dime, it can shift. I'm not trying to be a bearer of bad news. If it happened to Jesus, if it happened to the master, it'll happen to the student. If it happened to the teacher, it happens. You see what I'm saying? Like, so we see, you know, the people are enamored. They, they love what he's saying. They see uh, the, the authority in his teaching. And then all of a sudden he said one th a couple things. And you can read it for yourself. I just don't have time to get into it. And, and it, the whole thing shifts. Okay, they're ready to kill him. They're ready to throw him off. Can you imagine that? Driving him out of the synagogue that he used to go to. But let's, let's back up and let's get back into the mission statement. So he asks for, uh, you know, they bring him the, the, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. They hand it to him. He unrolls it. This, by the way, is the ultimate mic drop. This is it. I mean, it's scroll drop or whatever, you know. But this, like, he basically just, just, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's appointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, release uh, of sight for the blind, release the oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Boom. And then he gets up again and says, and he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is it. It's begun. This is the mission. He's coming out of the desert, being tempted by the devil, coming forth with power. And it begins. And he says, this is it. And I've always felt, since I was a young man, I thought, man, that's it. Like, somewhere in there, you got to find yourself. Somewhere in there, your gifting fits, your calling fits. In the mission statement of Jesus, as he was sent into the world, you are sent into the world. In the same way, we talked about that last, last week, being in the world but not of it with, with Todd Coconato. And so um, I, I want to just kind of break this down a little bit because I believe that um, there's a lot of believers, and you, you know them, we're all part of the, you know, the Christian fraternity, and it really is a family first, and, uh, but there's a, there, there's a big difference between a Christian and practicing Christians, those who are on mission and those who are on vacation, <laughs> those who are checked in and those who are checked out. You know, there's a bit, just like there's a big difference between prayer and Burning prayer, fiery prayer, right? Like the, the, you can go through the motions but not have the power, a form of godliness but deny the power. So there's something there. God's saying, 
I want you to be a burning one. I want you to be on mission. I want you to be on point. And so we're going to talk about some of the things that, that take us from that place. But first, let's talk about, okay, we talk, I mentioned the, the Jesus movement, the Jesus revolution in the 70s. Praise God for it. I've met so many people that got saved in that time. Um, and the movie has come out, and the, there's an outbreak of hunger amongst the campuses and the young generation. So encouraging. Good news. Praise be to God. Let's fan this flame. Let's be part of this movement. Um, but first of all, let's break it down to uh, revolution. It, it, it means we got to, here's what I want to suggest to you guys this morning. We got to get beyond Jesus' revolution. The revolution is, is powerful. Let's, let's see what it looks like just by definition here. Um, and, and it means the overthrow of a government, overthrow of oppression over a, a political leader, a system, break out from under. How many of you guys have broken out from under the dominion of darkness that once held you. So the revolution is important. It needs to happen. It, it speaks of major change, change. And, and some, sometimes like God initiates his people to be the people of change. How many, have you ever tried to even calculate the amount of hospitals and schools and universities and the Ivy League schools that were started by Christians? Orphanages. I mean, there's, there's no other uh, religion that, that can can claim such goodwill and peace to the earth than the, the, the movement of Christianity in the earth. We've had our abuses and our issues too, but, but there is so many things where we change society for the good. Yesterday was a picture of peace and goodwill and generosity. When, when believers come together, stuff happens. Amen? And so, um, and Jesus, you know, when, when he called us to the mission that we just read that, mission statement, he says, I like to say to be on mission with Jesus. Slightly different EQ, but it still works, right? So where was I? On mission with Jesus. So, so remember Jesus says, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. And so he never just sends us out and says, yeah, go do that. It's not just a perf performance he's called us to. He's saying, man, come with me. I'll, I'll take you to places you've never been before. I'll allow you to be a burning, shining light in the darkness. And so um, it says that in, in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Same thing he wants you anointed with, right? And, and, and how he went around doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. God was with him. Jesus is with us through the Holy Spirit as we're on mission. Okay, let's talk a little deeper about, about mission. It's a special task for a person or a group of people by which they're charged. They're charged to do a mission. It can speak of a calling or, or a vocation. How many people know that there's no unemployment in the kingdom of heaven? I mean, if you're sitting around feeling unemployed, man, you're missing something. Something... Something didn't connect. Or you just got to get busy, not out of the flesh, but just say, Lord, sh connect the dots for me. Sh give me the relationships where I can be on mission, where I can be on point, where I can be fruitful, make impact in this short little vapor of a life you've given me. And it's the beautiful thing is we all have uh, a, a niche. We all have giftings. We have a place we fit. Okay? There's things that some of us are called to that others are not called to. But we're all called. There's a vocation in the kingdom. Amen? And so finding that is, are some of the happiest people that you'll ever find, are those who are serving on mission with Jesus. Fulfilled. Fruitful. Okay? Um, so I'm going to go on to talking about a few points here. I have talking about how does this begin, this whole Jesus mission? Well, it starts first and foremost, it has to, <laughs> with salvation. Anyone saved up in here? Without salvation, we, we go nowhere quick. We got nothing to offer. We got no future. But praise be to God for the wages of sin or death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The gift, someone say the gift of God. It's not, this is not about works. He, it was finished on the cross. It was Jesus' finished works that gives us the gift, the free gift of God, 
Salvation is a gift. Salvation is a gift. If we don't get that, we, we always uh, get, we're susceptible to a religious spirit, thinking we have to work our way there. You know, the, the, I believe the works is a fruit of that relationship. The fruit of that gift, it just comes out naturally, supernaturally. But there's a gift of God. We have to receive salvation through Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's point number one. I'm not going to stay on that long. But then we talked about revolution, where we, we uh, come out from the oppressive demonic realm, from the dominion of darkness. It, who's, you know, God's called us out of that darkness into his wonderful light. Can anyone witness that it really is wonderful in the light? I remember one time we went down to those mammoth caves uh, in Kentucky, and man, talk about a lesson in darkness. Who's ever been there? Who's ever been in some of those caves? I mean, it, I mean, when they turn the lights out, man, it is, I mean, you can go like this all you want. You're seeing nothing. And you can see why those little critters down there, they don't even bother having eyes. They're like a little salamanders. On. They got no eyes because what's the point? Right? And I believe that's what happens. If you stay in darkness, you start to lose your very vision. And that's why Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. But then he, God snatches a people. He chooses a people. He lights them up on fire. And he says, now go and be the light of the world. And get all those blind people. No longer doing church, the blind leading the blind. But being on mission with Jesus. On point with what he actually called us to do. Sometimes we do everything except what he's called us to do in church. Man, we got Christian aerobics going on. We got, you know, you know, we got good coffee. We got stuff. That's all just like fun little byproducts. But are we, are we on mission? Are we on point with the very point of your existence? Why has he prolonged your ex existence on earth? You're not here to just take up space. We have a mission. We have a calling. We have a vocation. We have a mandate. He rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son that he loves. The, I love that. The kingdom of his son that he loves. He says, I bring you into that. Who used to be under the dominion of darkness? Who remembers those times? And, and so easily we're susceptible to the temptations of darkness. We have to learn to flee the darkness and stay in the light. Amen? So then going on to the... the, the actual mission. So we move from salvation to revolution, throwing off the darkness. And then we learn to say, wow, the purpose for my existence, the purpose of why uh, I'm still here is to get on to this mission that we, we spoke of where the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. I always found it interesting that, you know, where he also says, you know, blessed are the poor for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in, in our society, our Westernized society, we, I think we've, you know, we have a hard time getting our, our head around the poor. And yet, you know, we're coming into times where there's more homelessness, there's more poverty coming upon our nation maybe than ever before. It's coming at us, you know. And we're going to have to decide, like, do we just sidestep all that and just move to the other side of town? Or are we part of the solution to the pollution of our times? And so proclaiming freedom for the captives, I'm going to talk some practical things in a little bit. So after we, we, we get on mission, stuff happens. We begin to win souls. We begin to win communities. We begin to win cities, especially when we work together. When there's a corporate anointing, we can do pretty much anything. Remember Jesus said, or, or God said in the Tower of Babel, said if I don't stop them with that kind of unity, they're building their way to heaven and they're making a name for themselves outside of relationship with God, he's like, if I don't stop them and stop them now, they'll make it. They'll, I mean, humans can do tremendous things when, when we're united. How much more the body of Christ with the anointing upon your life. Woo, come on, someone. And so w once we've, we're, we're on mission and things start to happen, we start to see reformation. Someone say reformation. God doesn't like things to be as they are. He wants to see his kingdom uh, superimposed, maybe that's not even the word. He wants to see his kingdom just push back like a bulldozer, like we saw with our community here, those that broke, busted, and disgusted, and addictions, and, and uh, fatherlessness, and all these things. And we literally saw the bulldozers. We had a vision in the beginning that God, we saw Jesus <laughs> riding on a bulldozer against overwhelming darkness and dysfunction. 
And we saw Jesus riding on a bulldozer. On the side of the bulldozer said, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And the Lord gave us this simple, simple strategy. He said, just begin to devise goodness, and eventually it's going to push the whole thing back. And we saw it. We saw it with our own eyes. We couldn't believe it. We thought maybe it would be a decade away. And all of a sudden, we get this notice. They're fixing to bulldoze everything. $28 million, rebuild the whole community, no more drug corner. And so we saw a taste of it. That's just a taste. But we're more than conquerors. So we got a conqueror. We got a couple of notches on our belt. Praise be to God. Glory be to God. However, I'm not satisfied with that yesterday's victory. God wants this whole city, a city of light. I mean, do you not think that God is jealous for Nashville? I mean, there's believers moving here from everywhere. There's ministries moving here. If we can't turn this, turn the lights on in this city, man, Lord, help America. But there's an awakening. If we can get the believers to be on mission, doing what God actually called us to do, being part of it in your own special way, with your gift set and your calling, then what happens? A reformation begins to come. Reformation means critical change, change that needs to happen, Remo- removing of abuses, okay? Transformation. How many know that, that you're called to be a transformer? Look at your neighbor and say, you're a transformer. Whether you know it or not, you're a transformer. You, you got that DNA, that transforming, the, the same gospel that transformed the whole world, turned the world upside down. It's in you. It's in us. Right. Woo! And then coming out of Reformation. Well, let me just tell you a story about Reformation, why it's so, so dear to my heart. Why it's part of, I believe, my fabric and my DNA. And if you're up in here, you're going to get some of that because that's what, that's what we are. That's what we do. You know, we don't, we don't I, I can't stand to leave things so broken and and, and depleted and defeated. I mean, I mean, I was a white boy from Canada. I still am a white boy, but been in America a long time now, so I'm, I'm kind of from here now. But, but when I came here, I began to see the inner cities of America going, oh, my goodness, what is that? Who lives there? How long have they lived there? Why does it look like that? And the rest of town looks like this. And I remember starting to think, is that just the way it is? And people was like, oh, the summation of the conversation was pretty much, don't worry about it. It's, it's dangerous. You know, it's, you know, you don't want to go there. But, but somehow some Jesus DNA, I believe, began to get into me. And I began to say, you know, what? On my clock, on my watch, this is just going to be like this? I'm a citizen of this city. I love this city. This city is going to change. This n- neighborhood's going to change. And you read the scripture and you go, oh, my goodness. It's everywhere. Once your eyes start opening to basic mercy and justice and compassion, you start realizing it's the very heart of the gospel, justice, mercy, And the love of God. Jesus said, these are the most important matters of the law. He said, do the former, tithe. That's what he's talking about. He says, but don't forget the heart of the gospel. Love your neighbor as yourself. Could it come down to this sums up the whole thing? Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. He actually says this sums it all up. It's not really rocket science. It's just share and be fair. Take care of one another. So many times we think it's a big religious exercise. But I believe that when it comes down to it, do we have the heart of Christ for our communities? Are we willing to fight for reformation, transformation? Are we the transformers of society? And and the outcome of that, once we've gone on mission with Jesus and we see the reformation come, we see transformation. I love seeing all these mama bears pop up in the school system say, "Uh uh-uh, not on my watch. You're not just taking my kids like that. They're, they're, the people are standing up and they're getting involved and they're standing for biblical truths and saying, you can't just, you know, uh, this whole trans thing is starting to be stolen just like the rainbow. No, we are the transformers <laughs> of society. Does this make sense? And there's people who are beginning to go, I, if I don't be a voice, that's what partly what happened, I believe, in the, in the 70s. Many people got saved, but we didn't occupy If you don't occupy the territory, something else comes in seven times worth. Worse. Woo! Come on, someone. And so from the Reformation comes Renaissance. And it means a spiritual rebirth. It means a creative rebirth. It means vitality and, and beauty comes back. And when you see a neighborhood that's transformed, if I could just take your pictures and show, I got a slideshow right in here. I like showing it to people because they can't, it, it just, you show the before and after of this community and you're just like, ding, like what? And you see the beauty and the color and everything starts to change. And all of a sudden we got nice lamp posts in here. And all of a sudden they actually put, I remember the day they started putting sidewalks and curbs on this street. I was like, what? We're going to have curbs like everyone else? 
Wow. You know, and, and people start to, uh, to feel a sense of dignity and a new beginning and renaissance. I'm telling you, we're made for renaissance. We're made to be creative as our creator. We're made to, to color the world. I remember when I was a young man, I went to, to uh, we were a, a Christian band, and we went into to Russia, the USSR, <laughs> back in the day. And, and it was still communist. I don't even know how we got in there. I'm not sure what happened. I didn't, I didn't ask many questions. They just sent us, and all of a sudden we're there. I'm like, wow, we're here. And everyone's getting saved. I mean, everywhere you go, the, you sing the gospel song, you speak of Jesus, the whole place, like 95 people, I want Jesus. This is in communist Russia. But it was one of the most depressing, oppressive places. I mean, they were, and, and one of the things I noticed, I just noticed, there's like no color here. There's no creativity. It was, it was just brown and, 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 and gray and black. And no one bothered with color or or. Or, or just anything beautiful. They didn't beautify things. I mean, who, who cares? You don't own anything. We're going to talk about ownership in a second. Okay? And so we saw God move, but I also saw the horrors of communism. Everything was a bribe. Everything was under the table. You couldn't get anything done without paying people off. And so the corruption of society can come quick, guys. And we're hanging in the balance even as this nation right now. And we need to be a voice. We need to be a light. Is this making sense? And so, um, so let's talk about uh, why many Christians are not on mission. What is it that trips us up? What is it that psychs us out? What is it that cuts in on us when we were run, maybe running a good mate, race? Maybe you were on mission for a while, but you look at your life now and you go, man, oh, just, I'm, I'm just a little tired. I mean, I just... or. Or what? You know, what has happened? I mean, I'll tell you something. Not just Christianity. I think it's just a human thing. You have to know how to reinvent yourself. It's called resurrection life. Time and time again. You might have been running good for a while, and you got a sideswipe, you got a hit, maybe a divorce, maybe something came that you just think, man, I'm just obliterated. I'm done. Am I good for anything? You know, and, and if something cuts in on you. Some, something happens that you weren't expecting, and now you got to say, well, where do I go from here? Is this making sense? And we have to know how, through the power of the Word of God, the power of His promises, how to reinvent ourselves or revigorate ourselves, revisit the promises, revisit the calling of God on your life. It's irrevocable. No one can take it from you. Yeah, you've messed up. I've messed up. But are you willing to keep on keeping on? Though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. That's the secret to success in the kingdom. Just keep rising. You got anywhere, anywhere else to go? Like they say in football, just if you're going to fall, just fall forward. Just get a few more yards. I mean, just, just do, make something out of it. Just keep falling forward. Does that make sense? All right. So let's look at this. So why are many Christians not on mission? Number one, fear. The currency of the kingdom, the atmosphere of the kingdom is faith. The opposite is fear. I believe Satan's kingdom is fueled by fear. By fear, people are paralyzed. By, by fear, people are petrified. By fear has caused humans to do the most stupid things in, in human history. Fear causes wars, jealousy, fear, these things that just fuel where people do, like, are you kidding me? We, we really did that? We really started that war? We really started that fight? We really had so much pride and ego we wouldn't forgive? Or this happened? Or, or you know, these things happen. But the number one thing that the devil uses is fear. That's how he advances his kingdom. God advances his kingdom through faith. Think about it. The elites uh, take over society through fear that comes through a crisis. That's how it works. The elites, those in charge, when they want to get some more ground, some more control, they'll just throw a crisis that way and say, oh, excuse me, I'll just come right in here and I'll, I am now the solution to your crisis. Usually a man-made crisis for, on the, for the purpose of more control. And it's happened time and time again. And so uh, this is exactly how the devil works. If he can get you in panic, he can take your stuff. Because you drop that shield of faith and those fiery darts are hitting you. And how good are you when all those fiery darts incoming, incoming, incoming? So we've got to raise that shield of faith and say, uh-uh, not on my watch. Not with my God by my side. I'm on a mission with Jesus. I'm not alone. He never put me out here on my own. Does this make sense? 
And so fear is one of the main ways. And I don't have time to go. We could literally do a whole message on each one of these and, and how to come out of them, how to be delivered. But uh, let me just touch on these right now. The next one, why I believe many Christians are not on mission, is escapism. We've been entertained to death, and especially in our modern society. We've been amused. Amuse, the, very, the very essence of that word amuse means to be distracted, to be pulled away, to be diverted. And if you stay diverted long enough, you become perverted. If you linger in those places on the internet and all of a sudden, you know, next thing you know, where did you end up? Does this make sense? Escapism. A lot of people, like, you know, you might even be able to say, yeah, I know what my escapism is. Like, not in a healthy way. There's healthy escapisms. <laughs> but there's a lot of unhealthy things that we can get ourselves into that literally just swallow up time. Time is the most valuable thing we have. It's the most valuable thing we have and that we never know how much of it we have left. We're spending it right now. Every day should be a wonder. Every day should be like, wow, God, how can I serve you? How can I fulfill the calling? How can I be on mission? Does this make sense? So escapism. I won't go deeper in that, but you all can figure it out. You know, it speaks, speaks into addictions and and things that might be even a good thing, but a good thing, if there's too much of a good thing in your life, it can become an idol. It be something you love to do. What have I had to beat back all my life? Music. Beat it back. Beat it back. Keep it in its place. Things that you love. How many people like golf? Now, golf never, I could, never tempts me. I'm like, I'm, I'm good. You know, It's not my thing, right? What's your thing? I remember a long time ago, I've shared this before, but I was a brand new pastor, just our pastor, and one of our actually worship leaders, came up to us, and, and, and one of the guys said, uh, he said, my wife, man, I just, I just need help. I need help. I'm like, I'm like, oh, well, what's wrong, you know? He said, you know, she's just got this, this, this shopping thing, this shopping ad addiction. And I'm thinking, oh, can't be that bad, you know? I'm thinking, I, I remember thinking, like, shopping addiction, you know, we're dealing with crack addicts over here. We're like, <laughs> you know, we're like, what, what's a shopping addiction? And then I remember I just kind of gave a little trite answer. Maybe I prayed for him a little bit, but like, oh, you'll be all right, you know. And uh, it can't be that bad. And then he comes back a month later. He goes, he goes man, it's, it's, it's destroying us. I, I, like, what do you mean? Like, that's shopping addiction. I was t like, well, what do you, like, tell, tell me a little more. Like, what are you talking about? And he says, well, put it this way. She won't wear the same clothes, like, twice. Like, um, she'll wear clothes and she like wear it once and then on to the next one, the next one. And my, our closet, our house is getting taken over. Our credit cards are maxed out. I'm like, oh, my goodness. You do have a problem. <laughs> and then I really prayed for him. And we, we actually sat down and talked about it. But anything can begin to cut in on you and get you diverted and perverted and off track, right? Okay, here's another one. Dis, uh, things that keep... Christians from being on mission is you're dismissed. You feel dismissed. Instead of on mission, you've been dismissed. You're dismissed. You're a soldier in the army. No, no you've, you've been cut loose now. You're dismissed. You're off mission. Well, who says that? Well, the devil comes and he lies to you. He says, you're no, you're no longer needed. You're no longer qualified. You've got nothing to offer. You've been replaced. There's a new generation coming or there's someone better, more talented or you used to do this, or used to do that, but now you are dismissed. You're no longer needed here. Thank you very much. And that's a real lie that, that the devil can, can come and tries to literally take people off mission. I'm telling you, Jesus never dismisses his children. The gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. They're yours. They're yours to keep. They're yours to steward. God's got a place for you. Yeah, you might have to reinvent yourself. Yeah, you might have to make a change. Yeah, you might have to shift a little bit for this or that. I'm not saying you don't navigate with the Holy Spirit, but you are valuable, you're important, you're called, and it's not, that's never going to change. Now, the devil will tell you opposite. And you need to go ahead and tell the devil, devil, you are dismissed by the power in the name of Jesus Christ and the victory of the cross. I'll tell you who's dismissed. You are no longer relevant up in here. I'm not listening to you. Does it make sense? Okay, another thing that, come, that cuts in on believers from being on mission of doing what the Lord has called us to do and being who he's called us to be is a sense of no responsibility. That's a big one. 
in our, in our day. That's a big one when we're, we're getting ready, ready to be uh, taken over by AI, where humans are going to be sitting around going, well, there used to be about a billion more jobs on the planet. Now what do we do? Now you think I'm just saying it. Did you see the first automated McDonald's are out there now? No humans at all. They've begun. It's here, guys. And, it's, and, and if you don't have a healthy work ethic and a job and a mission, you know, idle, what do they call it? I, I, not idolatry, but uh, idle hands is the devil's workshop or something like that. See, we need to be taking responsibility. We need to have a sense of ownership. I remember back when what got into me that kind of tipped me over the edge when I began to dabble with, you know, because of the words of Jesus, no, nothing else. Heidi Baker wasn't around back then. At least we didn't know about her. So there was nothing cool about serving the poor back then. Nothing. <laughs> I mean, it was, and, and I remember what got into me was the words of Jesus and, the, and his heart is compassion for the broken, for the least. And I was like starting to see that. And we were starting to, weekend warriors, we do an outreach with the homeless. And we'd see God show up in such profound ways. We're like, wow, the kingdom of heaven is here. This matters for eternity. And I remember uh, starting to, to, to feel that. But what really tipped it over the edge for me was a sense of ownership. Where I began to look around the city and look around this community where God had planted us and go, uh-uh, not on my watch. It just can't go on like this forever. This kind of pain, this kind of dysfunction. And you begin to take ownership. What has God called you to, take, to own? What domain, what sphere of impact of society? You know, I've heard of people taking ownership of a trailer park. This is mine. This is my peeps right over here. Ownership. I'm going to start to come in here. We're going to work with the kids. We're, you know, I remember we took ownership up in Kentucky f for a good season. A bunch of summers we had Kentucky. We had little white kids. We're used to all the little black kids here. Well, we went right up to Kentucky. And poor kids from the trailer parks, bringing them in. The same stories of dysfunction, sexual abuse, fatherlessness, drugs, same thing, same pain everywhere. Devil's, the devil's not very inventive. It's the same regurgitation of trying to, the demise of humanity, drag us to the pit. But once we took ownership, we said, no, we're, we're going to occupy this old camp that had been dilapidated and set aside. No one was even there. And we came there, and we dreamed. We drove around with my friend, Greg Sears, up there, and, and we said, maybe we could resurrect this. Maybe we could make a difference up here. I didn't know nothing about Kentucky or trailer parks or nothing. I didn't know nothing about inner city. The Lord loves to take you places. You're like, whoa, this is a little, I'm a little off balance here. I'm not sure what this is all about. And we went in, and God resurrected an entire camp, rebuilt it. They, they came in and mowed everything, refreshed everything, got it ready. And we had years of Kentucky camp with kids. And it was awesome. And we saw kids coming to Jesus and being rocked by the Holy Spirit. Kids that otherwise you can't even imagine their life, their home life. And so a sense of responsibility. What has God told you to take responsibility for? Ownership. When, when ownership sets in, it's a whole different thing. That's what I love about fireplace. You guys, I feel like you've taken ownership of this city, like the heart of the city right downtown. I mean, you, someone come along and yeah, you know, I don't know about all that. You know, what's your follow-up program? And, and, you know, those are all tourists. I mean, they're just going to, you know, get a little dose of Jesus and go home. I mean, some people, anyone can, 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 uh, can you know, what's the word, whatever. Minimize what you're doing. Thank you. That's a good word. I was going to say a different one, but uh, and, and, and they can rain on your parade. They come along with a critical spirit. It's like, well, what have you taken ownership of? How many neighborhoods have you seen transform? How many years have you spent in the prison with the guys that no one wants to visit? How many nursing homes have you been to? I mean, there's a lot of people who will talk smack. They'll talk in the kingdom. They're like, oh, they, you know, look at all the negative. Man, you just, you just get on mission. You take ownership, and you stay consistent, and you'll see transformation in the heart of the city. This is, I mean, if that light fireplace was not burning down there on Friday night like it does, I mean, where would we be? I mean, think about it. If there's no light, how dark can the darkness get? But if we're willing to be the salt and the light and to stand in the gap, and it might look pitiful. It might look like a little shepherd boy standing up against a giant. 
Oh, and all the rest of the guys run away, run away. And one little shepherd boy, like, okay, here we go. Let's hope this works. I think he was totally confident. He knew exactly what he was doing. Been there, done that, practiced that. I know, I know how to take this boy down. And I know my God who can step on this giant like a bug and he's fixing to. And we're going to feed you to the birds. And so there's something about it looks pitiful for a moment. We look pitiful when we first went in the community. We look pitiful. We look like, oh, oh, man, those guys are like, man, they're vulnerable. Look at them out there just trying to do something against this mountain of darkness. But we took ownership. We said, uh-uh. That's, what, that's all David did. He said, uh-uh, you know. He was the pizza delivery boy, and he went to be the hero. He's bringing bread and cheese for his, his brothers on the front lines. He, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, he's like, what's going on down here? Well, who's that guy? Why are you all not fighting him? I mean, and he's like, man, I've, I've been with my God out there in the shepherd's fields, and I've seen the Lord show up strong, and we took out a lion, and we took out a bear. We. He was on mission with Jesus. Come on. He was on mission with God. Yeah. And he's like, we are going to take out a giant. We got any giant killers up in this place this morning? And so, so let's move on. So taking responsibility, taking ownership. I've heard of churches taking ownership of a public school. All of a sudden, they say, we, together, we're going to do something. And I'm telling you, there's something about the corporate compassion, too. When we go together, we can do stuff that normally, you know, I remember I've said this before, but I'll say it again, because I grew up in the day where, you know, people would read the Bible and they go, oh, the gift of mercy. Someone needs to be doing that in this church. Gift of mercy. So they go, so all of a sudden, they announce, I remember the days when this would happen. The pastor would say, and Sister Ruth and Sister Barbara are going to lead up our mercy ministry. And they're going to have groceries. They're going to do this and this. And, and, and they stand up and they're like, yeah. <laughs> you know. And then six months later, a year later, man, they're just burnt out. Where would the sisters go? So when, it, when I was a little afraid when the Lord first said, get involved. Start serving the poor. Start touching the lost. Go to the prison. All these things. And, and, and it was, at first I was just like, no, uh, 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 I know where, what goes there. That's, that's a never-ending game right there. I might get pulled in too deep. And the Lord said, no, it's community compassion. I'm going to raise up a whole people group, have the same DNA. They read the Bible, and they said, Jesus said, so let's do it. Let's find a way. Let's go together. We saw that yesterday. An army of compassion rolling into a, a neighborhood that desperately needs Jesus. Next one, just to finish up these. What keeps a Christian from being on mission with Jesus? Uh, a victim mentality. A victim mentality. How many times do we hear that in today's society? Everybody's a victim. It's the new thing. Be a victim. And it, it's, it goes down to that woe is me. But I'm telling you, when you get Jesus, it's no longer woe is me. It's wow is me. It's a slight change. You just put, make that little woe of capital letters and wow is me. Look out, here I am. I'm representing Jesus and his kingdom to come. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we begin to proclaim the gospel. I'm a, more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. I mean, we begin to stand on the promises and all of a sudden you become the solution. You become the hero in the situation. You become the champion. Why? Because you threw off that victim mentality. That says you're disqualified. That says you, you've been beat up. You're, you, you've you, you got too many issues. You've had too many addictions. Too many falls from grace. And you, and you go, no, that's the thing. Jesus came for the sinner. You don't understand. He came for the broken people. He said, I didn't even come for the righteous. Because there is none. <laughs> that's why he never came for the righteous. There is none. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I came for the sinners. That means every one of us were on the same boat. Now, what are we going to do with this great salvation that we've been given? Are we going to extend it to those who need it most? Woo, come on, somebody. So then the last one here, I'll move on. Like I said, every one of these could be a whole. We could go deep into these. Maybe we should. But the last one here is selfishness. Why, why Christians, I know that one stings. Why are so many Christians not on mission? It's just straight up selfishness. Just self-consumed. Just, just all about me. Me and mine. 
You know, and we can even be selfish as a family unit. I've seen that so many times. We lived in the suburbs all these years. And a lot of people, they fall into this trap like, I'm married, now I have to take off a year or two, and we've got to nurture this marriage. And I'm not saying marriage is first, family first. Y'all got that? Y'all got God, family? I'm not saying that. But a lot of people will just literally, like, back out, and, like, we have to stay home and watch Netflix now and, and, and you know, have quality time. And, and, and they leave the mission of God undone. When, when the Bible tells me, at least the way I read it, is one puts a 1,000 to flight... Two plus 10,000 to flight. It's like, wow, come on, honey. We going to the front lines together. woo you know? And I mean, I, I think it should multiply 10 times when you get married. Yeah, you still need your quality time, your ro- romance time, intimacy time. If you're not doing that, you're going you're gonna to regret it, believe me. But we're still on mission. There's nothing in the Bible that says just, you know, go do all that. Oh, well, now we got kids. Oh, now we got kids. We just have to disappear. We got kids. We're no longer on mission. We're no longer on point. You don't, you won't, and I'm telling you, I believe there's a grace to just bring the family with you. That's what Sarah and I lived. I think Emily and Daniel turned out pretty good. Praise them. <laughs> but we, we, we go where, where the Lord calls us to go. We do what the Lord calls us to do. And, and the, so how do we break out of just straight-up selfishness, just getting consumed with this culture that's so built on self, selfishness? Well, we, we just read the very essence of Jesus. This is just a touching on it, but there's so many scriptures. Mark chapter 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to serve. Whenever I go into these places, where it might have been a bunch of conferences and big stadium gatherings and stuff like that, the Lord reminds me, and I say, you know what? I'm not going to get into this, this trap of the name, fame game. I'm, I'm just, Jesus came to serve. It was good enough for him. He was a son of man with the highest name above all. And he came not to be served, but to serve and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. And it sets me in the right place. I'm just here to serve. I'm just here to serve. I'm just here to help. I'm not looking for self-promotion. I'm not looking for uh, the accolades of men. And you come in with that attitude, and Jesus says the greatest among you will be your servant. You just took the greatest position you could take, the place where God can exalt you anytime he wants because you're of your attitude, your perspective. Thrown off the selfishness, which comes out of insecurity comes out of the fact we don't know we're sons and daughters. We don't know who we really are, what we've inherited. But once we know that, we were okay. Hey, my father promotes me. I don't know. All promotion comes from him. And if we really believe that, we're free. We're just free agents to love people and encourage people. You know, make them feel good. All you, want, you want to talk to someone, you want to make them feel good, just ask some questions about them. Hey, how long have you been here? What, what, what's your story? Da, da, da. Like, Man, that was the nicest guy I ever met. <laughs> These little little tricks, but they really work. <laughs> but do it with a genuine heart because everyone's life is precious and everyone has a story. And we need to know each other. And so here's the last one. I was just, Actually, that was the end of the things that keep us from the mission. But just to, to end, end it now, where it says from Isaiah where Jesus read, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. So you might say, uh, let's just break it down to something practical. Is it anyone like practical or are you just like an ethereal kind of vision and we go have lunch? Okay, we're going to get practical. And sometimes Jesus is painfully practical. He says, if a man has two tunics and a man has none, he should share one. If a man has food and sees a man who does not, he should share. I mean, it's amazing how practical the scripture really is. It's all, it's all there. And so, but let's, let's, let's break into that for a moment. Uh, he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. So you might say, well, oh, how, where do I begin? How do I do that? Well, we have the most beautiful, easy way you can begin. It's called the Meal of Hope. The Meal of Hope right here every Thursday night. It's been going, I don't know, everyone has a different number, but about at least 26 years. <laughs> at least 26 years of Thursday night Meal of Hope where the poor come from the community, inner city communities, from homeless that come. And it, it's been filling up, y'all. And it's a beautiful time. You can actually eat with the community, get to know names and stories. Uh, we have people that 
that preach. All our young guys cut their teeth on preaching with the poor, which I think is the very best way to do it. <laughs> and we have musicians playing, you know, setting an atmosphere. So that can happen every Thursday night. Volunteers come at 5. Would love for you to be part of it. Um, sometimes our numbers get thin. The Lord never leaves us hanging. There's always volunteers. There's always food. It, it, he, he's faithful 26 years. But there's times I'm like, man, more people could receive the blessing of being part of this. So the next one is uh, bind up the wound of the bro- wounds of the brokenhearted. So how do we do such a thing? We have a ministry called Inside Out Ministries, which is an amazing get you, get you free, keep you free ministry. Uh, my wife pioneered that years ago, and it's amazing. It's inner healing. It's counseling. It's deliverance. I mean, we straight up cast it out of you if we have to. We're not going to cancel uh, counsel this one out. We're going to cast it out. So you might be saying, well, I don't know about that. No, it's all biblical. Just read, read the Bible. If it's not Bible, don't go for it. But if it's there, get in on it. Get free, inside out. Also, binding up wounds of brokenhearted, the life groups have just started. I mean, just being able, you, there's things that you can do when you're known and you have time to pray, you get connected and, and know each other's stories and begin to care for one another. We're already hearing the tremendous stories of people connecting and getting known and opportunities to grow in the Bible, the Word, and fellowship and prayer. And so um, another way, uh, proclaiming freedom for the captives. Uh, this, is, this could happen every Friday night. You come here at 7 p.m., you get filled up. Half an hour of equipping, powerful equipping time, 8.30, and then hitting Broadway. And, and I think it really is intercession, too. I think it's, a, it's, it's literally being the salt and the light so our, 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 our city doesn't go to hell. Some say, no, not Nashville, Tennessee. No, I'm telling you, it's up for grabs right now. If you know the kind of wars that are fighting right now, I mean, there's cities right now are literally drawing the line of what city, what state are you going to be in? There's the, the, I just saw a gender refuge states and cities are being uh, uh, set up, and then others are saying, no, not in my state. And there's, the battle lines are being drawn all across our, our nation right now. And we're either going to be a voice and the salt and the light, or we're going to go like, oh, I missed that moment. And it's hard to get it back. Have we got prayer back in school yet? Hard to get it back, isn't it? Once you lose it, it's like, bye-bye for decades. Sad. you got to know when the battle's on, when the heat is on. There's a battle for Franklin coming. I'll tell you more soon about they've been trying to shut down prayer and worship and just basic gathering, civil rights, <laughs> Worship and a voice. And a lot of people are sleeping through it. Jay's been at every single meeting, speaking up, being a voice. They finally dropped some of the ordinances, but it's not over. The pride movement is trying to take over. It, 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 it wants all these places, guys. And we're either going to believe the Bible and be a voice and be a light, or we're just going to sleep through it and then, and then apologize to our kids someday. Well, America used to be a beautiful place. Used to be a godly place. And so... Fireplace, standing in the gap, being setting captives free, um, discipleship. We have uh, intensive program coming up. It's amazing. We watch people that that uh, young people that get lit up in one week. It's amazing what God can do in a week. Make the heavens and the earth. One week, kids that actually have stamina and substance and staying power that go into college and they don't just get swept away by the ideologies. It's amazing the, these things. So uh, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Prophetic ministry, you know, being able to declare what the day of God's vengeance. We have pro- pro- prophetic ministry here, but we also do prophetic training. And there's things that you can get in on that. Also, uh, the declaration of the prayer room Tuesday nights. I believe that it's literally shaping and shaking our nation as just, Jesus said, if two would agree together on earth, it'll be done for us by our Father who's in heaven. Woo! What about when we got 20? What about when we got 30? And we're standing on the word. We're not just praying our opinions. We're declaring the word. We're singing the word. We're bringing it back to God. Say, God, you said. And so there's so many ways to get involved. We've got mission trips launching this summer. Rolling Thunder is going to roll again. All these things. So I just wanted to put this out there for you guys because I want to be practical with such a message. I know it's a lot. I kind of threw a lot at you. But it's, it says that the, if you read a little further, Isaiah 61, it says, those who do these things that we just talked of, preaching the good news of the poor, binding up wounds of broken hearts, setting captives free, these things, comforting those who mourn, life groups, these things, 
where we can do these things. It says, they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore places long devastated. They will renew ruined cities and the, the devas- that have been devastated for generations. You can, you can literally break the curse of generations, of broken places that everyone's given up on. You're part of this mission. Who wants to be on mission with Jesus? Let's, let's stand up. Let's stand up. Thank you, Jesus. Let's do this together. It's community compassion. It's community calling. And everyone has a unique piece, but let's fit our pieces together. How did they rebuild Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day? Every person had to build their piece and then connect with the pieces of the wall right beside, to the right and the left. It all had to connect somehow strategically, uniquely, precisely according to God's design. God has a design for our gifts, our callings, our impact in this life, and we do it together. So, Father, we just thank you for this inspiration that comes straight up from Jesus' moment of just saying, today you see it fulfilled. I'm, when Jesus was beginning his mission, when he was on mission, he says, now it begins. And, Lord, we ask that we could do the same, Lord. We could be part of that great incoming, that great calling of the harvesters, for this harvest that's at hand, for our nation that hangs in the balance, and, Lord, the compassion that needs to go forth, Lord, the good news that's yet to be declared. Lord, I pray you'd open up doors for people, doors of impact, influence, Lord, opportunities to be a voice. Whether people love us or not, one moment they love Jesus, next moment they didn't. They're ready to kill him. Lord, I pray you'd raise up a people with such fortitude, that it didn't matter. It's the popularity polls. Don't, we don't give a rip about that. It's not about where we stand or what people think of us. Lord, it's being faithful to the call, faithful to the mission you've put before us, God, and explicitly called us to, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.